Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Hello, Ben. Hello, Tommy. How's your uh, How's your midterm madness bracket? You know, I'm. I just dove into that. Uh, I've not filled mine out. Pretty yet well done. Yeah. My, uh, my, I didn't do a March Madness bracket, but if I had, it was a disaster. Absolute yeah, absolute disaster. Yeah. No, I, I lost the thread on that like about ten years ago. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, the midterms are fast approaching, and we're a little nervous about the midterms. <laughs> yeah, I would say, yeah. Uh, go to votesaveamericacom slash midterm dash madness if you want to pick a region, get involved. We'll send you ways to volunteer, donate, candidates to support. It's a great way to do it. Yeah. It's fun. We'll compete. Yeah, it's good. It's going to be here before you know it. Uh, well, the elections are on my mind because you did an interview today about a big election in Hungary. I did. I did. Uh, I talked to Catalan Che, who uh, was actually a, uh, one of the leading characters in my book. Um, she's a young um, member of parliament uh, for the European parliament, part of the Hungarian opposition, obviously. Great Twitter follow. Great Twitter follow. Um, and uh, Orban's election is coming up in a few days. Um, Boo. The playing field is not level. Um, Boo <laughs> as you'll hear Catalan describe, you know, that the districts are drawn in this crazy way where Orban got less than 50% of the vote last time, but won two thirds of the seats. Mm, um, feels familiar. So they have to, they have to kind of overperform just to have a shot here. But the polls are neck and neck. Um, she talks about the opposition strategy of uniting against Orban. She talks about the stakes in a very powerful way, why we all have a, a, a stake in Hungary not staying <laughs> under Viktor Orban uh, for the sake of the unity of our alliances, but also the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and she talks about how Orban has been this outlier in Europe, um, you know, not going along with certain sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, I think very powerfully talking about how the war as presented on Hungarian television, which is largely controlled by Orban, is not the war that is actually happening, uh, a little Russian propaganda um, seeping in Hungary. And so it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an important election. Uh, we uh, midterm mid midterm madness uh, should also include uh, hopefully the Hungarian opposition uh, taking its best shot at Viktor Orban and uh, and the Hungarian perspective on the war was re was really interesting to hear. There we go. As you guys can probably tell, we're going to talk about Ukraine today, but also some other issues. So for Ukraine, some news about peace talks. President Biden just went to Europe. That made a little news. You might have noticed, Ben. Uh, there's some updates in the war effort generally, and then President Trump weighed in again. So we're grateful for that. Uh, then we're going to talk about. Uh, some news out of China, Israel, Iran, North Korea, Afghanistan, and Jamaica, and then Ben's interview. So Ben, I mean, we got some rare good news out of Ukraine today, kind of. Kind of, maybe. Right, kind of, maybe. So there, there's signs that the peace talks between Russia and Ukraine are making progress. On Tuesday, Russia said that they would scale back military activity in northern Ukraine around Kiev. Uh, and Ukraine suggested that they were open to a 15-year process of negotiations about the status of Crimea. That leaves the major question of what happens in eastern Ukraine, the Donbass region. Zelensky's staff has suggested that that would get negotiated by Zelensky and Putin. Um, the Ukrainians have also said they would agree not to join NATO or host foreign bases if they got some sort of Article 5-like security guarantee from some collection of countries. Um, the Financial Times also reported that the Russians are no longer demanding that Ukraine be denazified, whatever that meant to begin with, that ever yeah. Meant, yeah, and they might accept, and the Russians might accept Ukraine joining the EU as long as they don't join NATO. So these talks are happening now in, in Istanbul. Um, it's worth noting, like the the this wasn't like a leak. Uh, the Russian defense minister is the one who made the comment about scaling back military activity. So I don't know, whatever. Um, lots of reasons to be skeptical. They lie constantly. Putin lies constantly and with impunity. Too. There's some reports that peace negotiators from a previous set of talks were actually poisoned. Uh, including uh, a Russian oligarch named Roman Abramovich, the owner of the Chelsea football team. Um, those other people say that was food poisoning. It's hard to know what's going on there. Yeah. Bellingcat is really good, well-sourced on these issues, is the one who came out and confirmed, along with the Wall Street Journal, that someone was poisoned. And then there's just longstanding concerns that we've talked about before that Putin could use peace talks as a delaying tactic while he regroups and resupplies and you know doubles down on the military efforts. So... I don't know, Ben. Obviously, we all want peace talks to work and be successful. Uh, it's notable that Tony Blinken is kind of like show, don't tell was his message, I think, to the world today. What, what did you make of these reports and the sort of flurry of news this morning? So uh, I think here's what's positive. I mean, you know, we've talked a bit before about how I think denazification and demilitarization was code for regime change in Kiev yeah. and a uh, Russian-backed government. Um, and so I think what this confirms, at least for the time being, is that Russia recognizes it cannot achieve its maximalist military objectives mm -hmm. of toppling the government. Um, so this is a bit like Russia adjusting to the reality that they're facing this kind of 
permanent resistance. They've also suffered some military setbacks recently. So Ukrainians went on offense around Kyiv. They took back this town, Irpin, which is outside of Kyiv, mm -hmm. and they basically prevented Russia from being able to encircle the city. Yep. Um, so again, th some of this may just be in the positive sense, kind of Russia adjusting to uh, lower war aims, right? Now, what's interesting about it is if you look at the outlines of, this, uh, uh, of what's being discussed, which the Ukrainians have talked about openly, okay, not being a member of NATO and having a degree of neutrality, um, some kind of longstanding kick the can down the road discussion on Crimea. 15 years. Yeah. Awful um, long time. And then, you know, this very ambiguous um, commitment to uh, negotiate the Donbass region later. Part of what's interesting about that is that's, that's a deal that kind of describes the status quo before the war. You yeah. know, Ukraine was not a member of NATO. Right. Russia had already annexed Crimea and Russia was de facto occupying yes. these two regions. Now, here's what's changed though. And here's why this is, I think, still very perilous and complicated. Russia has consumed more territory. They have expanded the areas of Eastern Ukraine, the Donbass region that they control beyond those provinces kind of out to be the entire Donbass region. Yeah, they're trying to create, take that whole Southeastern border so they have a land bridge to That's Crimea. right, yeah. that's right. And so if Putin essentially occupies Mariupol, which doesn't exist because he's destroyed the they city and occupies the entire Donbass region, and, and that's kind of the, the platform from which he's now having this longer term negotiation, that's a huge chunk of Ukrainian territory right. that goes beyond the pre-war status quo. And, and so there's something very, I think, <laughs> unappealing, uh, not strong enough a word, very, very offensive, frankly, um, for Ukrainians to be asked to accept, okay, the Russians just kind of destroyed huge chunks of your country. Uh, Russia's de facto occupying bigger chunks of, it, of your country than it did before the war. And that's the peace deal, you know? Um, yeah. And so I think it's going to be hard. Zelensky said he put this to a referendum. Uh, again, like an, R Russia not withdrawing at least at least all the way back to where they were at the beginning, uh, if not getting out of Eastern Ukraine entirely, this is going to be the rub. And, and again, as you alluded to, part of the challenge here is that as much as we'd like to see an end to the violence and the, an end to the suffering, the, the reality is the Russians can't be trusted uh, at all, no. you know? And yeah. so- I feel I, I fear there would be a circumstance where you know maybe there'll even be a deal, but will it stick? Uh, will the Russian definition of what you know right. Donbas is that they occupy match the Ukrainian one? And let me get into that because like that feels really complicated to me because Putin could withdraw troops, but there's still these separatists there, and if those guys stick around and they're still trying to topple the regional governments and they're still fighting Ukrainian forces, it's not clear to me how Zelensky will react to that and what that will mean in terms of you know, US sanctions or international sanctions generally, right? I mean, wh how we decide when this is over if Russians are de facto occupying all this territory, unless Zelensky's like cool with it. Yeah, and and, and you know, again, what what's the status of Mariupol, you know, like, yeah. and, and can the Ukrainians rebuild? And um, it, same thing with the Donbass region, which has suffered enormous destruction as well. I mean, again, I, I think that if you could have like a, a lasting, ceasefire in which the Russians really did pull back and obviously the shelling stopped and Ukrainians could return to their homes in places like Kyiv and some of these other cities. That's to the good. Um, but these larger questions, this is not going to be settled in a couple of weeks. Even if they come out and say they have the outlines of a deal in a couple of weeks, um, you know, we have to recognize that, as, as Tony Blinken said, like, we have to watch what the Russians do here. Um, there's also the, me, the question, you mentioned this security guarantees issue. This is an interesting formula. Uh, essentially, there's a bunch of NATO countries right. uh, that include the United States and yeah. the UK and Turkey and others that uh, are being asked to give a de facto Article 5 guarantee that essentially says, if Ukraine is attacked again, we will come to their assistance, which is not NATO membership, but is something... It's a kind big thing for us to, to it, right? To. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, uh, it is, and uh, and 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 the thing is, would the you know the Russians have to agree to that too? So, look, I I I, I applaud them on being creative um, in these formulas and just trying to find something that can work. Um, it's very interesting to me that the talks have moved from Belarus to to Turkey, so it moved from being really an away game for the mm -hmm. Ukrainians to being, if not a home game, something closer to it. Yeah, the Turks don't love the Russians. They don't, and it's a sign. Again, it's a sign. Like, if there's a positive in all this. It's like the Russians. This is not where they wanted to be. No, you know, they, when they when they launched the war, they did not think that six weeks later 
they'd be negotiating in Turkey for much less than what they wanted. Yeah, this is not the strongman situation that Putin was hoping for. Um, you know, you you mentioned this. I mean, the humanitarian situation in Mariupol is horrific. The city is getting shelled, but yeah. also they're just, the Russians are just starving people there out. I mean, hunger is a is a tool of war. Um, a couple more just sort of random military updates. There's these reports that the Ukrainian military has launched these counteroffensives, as you mentioned, including in the northeast. There are some disturbing videos of Ukrainian soldiers allegedly torturing or maybe even shooting in the leg Russian POWs. Then I saw some other reports suggesting that those videos were actually I was going to say, well, those have to be verified. Yeah, again, so we yeah, don't know. Yeah, you gotta like, they, we will have to get to the bottom of that. The Ukrainian government will. There's more reports that the Russian mercenaries called the Wagner Group are being sent to Russia. Uh, they're private militia creeps. They are known for committing war crimes. And the UK has said several times that their mission... The Wagner Group's mission is to assassinate President Zelensky. And then lastly, you know, there's some reports, I think, last week, Ben, at the end of last week, that the White House has a special team meeting several times a week to game out the U.S. response to possible chemical or nuclear weapons used by Russia. So really no surprise there. Um, but it's just sort of a mixed bag. The other thing I noticed that was interesting was the Times had a report about how much and how active President uh, Macron has been of France in, in talks. He's called... Um, He's called Putin 17 times, met with him once. He called Zelensky 25 times and met with him twice. So it's interesting to watch him sort of insert himself in this process and see if that will bear fruit. It hasn't borne any fruit to date. Yet, uh, no. I mean, one of the things that Macron had talked about was some kind of French-led humanitarian evacuation of Mariupol, um, which would be great. But even today, Macron announced that Putin had basically said no to that. So yeah. this is yet to kind of lead anywhere. I, 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 It's all well and good to keep channels open. But at the end of the day, uh, it does appear that this whatever's happening in Turkey, this the, the Turkish mediation channel the main event. feels like the main event and Macron feels like the sideshow. The Roman Abramovich thing is kind of interesting to me. Um, yeah, this is like a, a very close oligarch ally buddy of Putin. So yeah, this guy was um, he he was a, a governor for uh, under Putin inside of Russia. So he was a, you know an active participant. Yeah, he was um, a rich guy who got basically dispatched to the middle of nowhere yeah, in Siberia and yeah, told yeah, to run yeah, for yeah. governor. And he yeah, was like, yeah, yeah, go for that. <laughs> uh, but his reward was you know he got to go to London. But yeah. he was you know literally we talked about this referred to as Putin's wallet. He's been sanctioned by a bunch of countries, the the, the British, the Europeans, not been sanctioned by the U.S. because uh, apparently Zelensky asked that he not be because of this mediation role he's playing. And then it pops up that he was potentially poisoned. Uh, he's got a lot of connections with Erdogan, who, you know, you'll recall is not the, doesn't have the cleanest hands either. No, <laughs> you know, so no, no. Corruption uh, flows in lots of different ways. So um, hard to know what exactly to make of Abramovich's role, but uh, there's clearly a role that he is playing. Um, yeah. Which, uh, again, I think the other thing that to be concerned about in all this is like, who really speaks for Putin? You know, like, do these people at the table... Uh, you know, they may think that they're empowered to negotiate, uh, but it right. may not be what the actual play is because the only person who really knows is is Putin himself. I do like that Abramovich in the past has denied being tied to Putin or being an oligarch Which is at bullshit. All. Total <laughs> bullshit. Nonsense. It's complete nonsense. Uh, yeah. But yeah, now he's over uh, leading negotiations and reportedly went blind for a couple hours because of whatever this poisoning was, that skin was falling off their hands, their faces turned red. God knows who, who we... We're not, we have not gotten to the bottom. So the other, you know, big news, I think, of the U.S. was President Biden went to Europe last week and met with NATO, the European Union, uh, the G7. They announced some new sanctions. They talked about sanctions enforcement efforts, which is interesting because Zelensky has been pretty critical of sanctions enforcement lately. Um, Biden went to Poland as well, where he met with U.S. troops, announced a billion in aid for refugees, met with some Ukrainian refugees, especially some small kids. And then he gave this major speech about the war. Most of the reporting uh, of that speech, or on that speech rather, has been focused on this uh, ad lib near the end. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Ben, I offered my hot take on the Biden speech and the ad lib on uh, Pots of America Monday. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, but also on the cleanup, the clarification that the White House has offered a couple of times now that essentially Biden was just expressing moral outrage and not a policy change. Do you think a president can sort of credibly make that distinction? Can Biden, you know, can he Selena Zito himself? Can he take me seriously, but not literally? So I, I want to start this by saying I think that, you know, in, in general, that trip was quite successful and kind of reinforcing 
the steps that have been taken in terms of solidifying uh, the allies that are you know, imposing sanctions and yeah, arming Ukrainians. I agree. So I'm going to focus on a couple areas where, where there are problems, including that comment. The sanctions point is real. If you look at the data, the ruble has recovered. Um, the Europeans have, have not really imposed swift sanctions on on that many of the largest Russian swift banks. Swift banking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some holes in the sanction regime that do need to be patched up. This is not just Zelensky rhetoric. And frankly, the biggest hole is that the Europeans continue to buy all this oil and gas right. from Russia. Yes. Um, but also the, what, what are called secondary sanctions, essentially going around the world and sanctioning other countries that buy Russian oil and gas, those types of things, that does have to be done. Second, on refugees, I'm glad that they hit the note. I'm glad that they made the announcement of the 100,000 refugees. We need to hold their feet to the fire because they have not met their refugee commitments in, in, uh, this in, this administration in general, right? You know, they, they said they're going to take in 125,000 refugees this year. I think they're on pace to take something like 17,000. So- one, one seven? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I, they, they, I hope that's true, that they're going to take 100,000. Yeah. But like it bears uh, fruit. Now- on the the speech, look, I I thought it was a, you, I agree with your take. I thought it was a really good speech, uh, probably the best of his presidency. He laid it all out. He laid out the stakes. He drew the outlines around the policy. He prepared people for a long struggle. He rightly made this an exemplar of the broader mm -hmm. struggle between freedom and, and and tyranny in the world, democracy and autocracy. Um, and and it was not a regime change speech. That clearly wasn't a no. change in policy. Um, no. And so he said what like any normal person watching this thinks, which is like, my God, like how can Putin stay in power? Um, they clarified it and I thought that was fine and right. I don't really understand why he felt like he had to come out and say, actually, no, I really did mean that because pr president's views are not personal. <laughs> like, so, so I, Especially on foreign policy. Yeah. I mean, I, so look, I, I don't think in the grand scheme of things, I don't think this is a huge deal. I don't think that it, it gives Putin some ammo that he didn't already have. The, like That's the, the thing know, I'm the, so sick of hearing. It's yeah. like, guys, Putin is going to lie and manipulate the media and do whatever he wants to do. And he inva just invaded a sovereign country. He doesn't need some pretext from Joe Biden based on a speech. Shut we, up. Yeah. I was on lots of these phone calls with Obama and Putin in the late Obama years where Putin would always say that your policy is regime change. Yes. And Obama would be like, no, it's not. And Putin believes, or at least says, that he believes that U.S. policy is regime change. And he has said that for a very long time. He accused Hillary Clinton of trying to topple his government in 2012. Because she issued a written <laughs> statement, I think, about <laughs> right. the, the parliamentary elections, right? Like He kicked a bunch of NGOs out of the country several, decades ago. I yeah. Mean, so this is one where like, I don't really agree with like anybody because I, like, I don't agree with the press obsession on this because like, will Putin say that this is proof uh, of U.S. policy for regime change? Yes. Sure. But he'll say that about everything we do. He'll say it, that about its sanctions. It's like they know? report on Putin like they do Mitch McConnell. Yeah. Right? It's like a bad faith actor who's known to lie. Like you don't have to take his spin. Yeah. And so I I, I think that it's kind of like it's, it's much ado about not much. I mean, like if you had a policy of regime change, you would be trying to overthrow the Russian government and we don't have that policy and we're not trying to do that. Um, and, and so I guess if Biden wants to kind of stand by the kind of moral outrage, I think that's fine. Um, but I also, you know, saying that the president has personal views that are separate from policy is a little weird. Look, you know? it's high stake stuff. It's not the time to ad lib. Like, obviously it was a mistake. I just think like, that's a one day story. He corrected yeah. it. I, everyone's right. Right. The, we don't want to send Every, the yeah, wrong message yeah. to Russia. That's fine. But like, let's, he corrected it 20 times now. Let's just fucking move let's on. Let's move on. Yeah. What is it about Poland, by the way? Remember Governor Romney? What about your gas? <laughs> yeah, yeah. For those of you listening, one of my favorite things that happened in the 2012 election was Mitt Romney did a foreign trip where he like went to the UK and pissed off everybody there about Olympics preparations, and then went to Israel, Israel yeah. and then went to Poland. And uh, Ashley Parker and uh, another- Phil Rucker. Phil Rucker yeah. were trying to Great ask Great reporters, by the way. I love Ashley and Phil, yeah. We're trying to ask him a question, uh, and this is how it went. Governor! Do you have a statement for the Palestinians? What about your gaff? <laughs> this is my favorite thing yeah. that ever happened. Uh, all right, Ben. So a couple more things out of Ukraine uh, or out of Ukraine and Russia. So Novaya Gazeta, the, the largest major, last major independent media outlet in Russia, suspended operations Monday. So getting harder and harder out there for uh, Russian citizens to get real news or not state run news. Zelensky did a bunch of interviews. He talked with Russian outlets, which was interesting and savvy, I think, to try to talk directly to the Russian people. He also talked to The Economist, where he got quite emotional about how 
the Russians haven't been collecting or burying their dead soldiers. Yeah, that's very powerful. Really powerful yeah. part of the interview. Uh, accused the Russians of kidnapping or killing mayors and replacing them with Russian loyalists, basically. And as we talked about a second ago, criticized Western sanctions as incomplete. Anything else or anything in these interviews stand out as particularly interesting to you? I thought that the comments to the to both the economist and the Russian uh, journalists about the way in which the Russian military uses and Putin uses these troops as just cannon fodder, mm -hmm. and you you know Zelensky referred to them as kids, as children. You know, these are eighteen, nineteen year old Russians. Yeah. They leave their bodies behind, um, and he seemed to be you know, showing real moral disgust. Um, it wasn't just like an information operation point to reach the Russian public. It was like real disgust for how Russia just dehumanizes even its own troops. Um, you know, you can feel part of what's interesting about Zelensky, you know, he seems to to, to kind of like hyper experience the war. I mean, mm -hmm. all Ukrainians do, but like, you know, even, um, you know, feeling for these Russian troops that are obviously being killed by Ukrainian uh, troops, um, you know, I, I think it's really powerful. And and once again, kind of drew drew out the, the moral stakes at play here. Um, you know, the problem in watching that, that interview of the Russian media is that, you know, how much of, of this is going to, if it reached the Russian public, it'd be incredibly powerful. I just, you know, it's hard to say, how many Russians will be able to access that with VPNs or right. different ways? It's getting harder and harder. And and so watching Zelensky and those remaining, you know, independent Russian news outlets, most of whom are either shut down or have had to leave the country, kind of underscored the degree to which he's having a conversation that is just not going to get into Russia. But what is going to get into Russia is the fact that these troops are being killed. And in some cases, by the way, they're not bodies coming home. I mean, that, uh, like I see some vulnerability here in the long run. The Russians can't, you can't hide the reality that your son isn't coming home, you know? And if you don't even give a shit enough to like recover remains that the Ukrainians are trying to provide to you, imagine losing your your, your son in some bullshit fucking war um, for a bunch of lies. And then, you know, your government doesn't even give a shit enough to, to bring their body home. Yeah, I, or... It is something that, again, could trigger, you know, Different types of opposition to the war in Russia, or fighting in you know the the northern Kiev region, which you know that mission just gets abandoned after a couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, then the just... you know deputy defense minister comes out and says, "Well, well actually, you know, yeah, yeah, we weren't really going to try yeah. to take no, you our bad, our yeah. bad." Yeah. yeah, no, it's interesting. You know, Solinsky, what I came away with thinking is like, wow, it's, uh, this guy's got like a pretty deep well of empathy if he's carrying he does. About, you know Russian soldiers. Obviously, he's a savvy guy and he knows the impact that this kind of comment would have in Russia with mothers and fathers of troops, but. Well, he had, a, and he also just, he had a great, uh, just because we had the Hungary interview later, like he had a great appeal to Orban. Where that was, was great. Basically like, Victor. <laughs> Victor, go, go, you know, I love Budapest. Go down to the Holocaust Memorial yeah. on the river there and look at the empty shoes uh, of all the, the people who were lost in the Holocaust. Um, and, and actually, I saw a lot of Hungarians have placed more shoes on mm -hmm. that riverbank. So he's just, he's been able to hit these notes. I am glad, Tommy that he didn't take his buddy Sean Penn's uh, advice and pipe into the Oscars. Imagine if Zelensky, uh, we're, we're not going to get into the slap here, obviously, no. but like uh, imagine if Zelensky piped in with some emotional video and then like Will Smith uh, wailed uh, Chris Rock <laughs> right after it. Like it so, wouldn't have been the best look. I so was gonna good, good judgment by Zelensky I, there too. I was going to mention, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Sean Penn made news over the weekend. He said that if the Academy Awards didn't invite President Zelensky to speak on Sunday, that he would smelt his Oscar <laughs> in public. So... Zelensky didn't speak. There was a weird crypto.com ad that mixed commerce and yeah. Ukraine in a kind of a weird way. I've never attended a smelting myself. I did agree <laughs> with you. Like, obviously, Sean Penn's heart is in the right place. I think he's yes. in Ukraine. And I like Sean Penn. A documentary yeah. about refugees. But I do worry that the second something is on the Oscars, the Academy, or any award show or seen as Hollywood, it can be seen as divisive by half the country. Yeah, no, it's the right. It was the right call. I mean, he's... He's, he's, you know, he's continues to hit the right notes. And, but I mean, he's in, there's a growing, I mean, I, I think the one point we should make is there is a growing gap between Ukrainian, the Ukrainians did not love that Biden speech. Nope. And I heard you hit that on PSA rightly. They, they didn't see anything new in it. Um, no new weapon systems, no new planes, no new sanctions. Um, they, they're frustrated. And, you know, the solidarity we feel for Ukrainians, um, they, they're not feeling it as much as they would like. And and that could, that gap could grow unless we 
do escalate things like sanctions enforcement and the types of weapons we're providing. Yes. Zelensky very pointedly said, now you're telling me that I have to wait for chemical weapons use on my people before yeah. you put in more sanctions? He's like, basically, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. was the takeaway. Yeah. Um, speaking of the, the Ukrainian people, you know, we, we've been doing a series of interviews with you know young people in Ukraine and, and about their experience. Uh, we checked back in with a woman named Alexandra. She's a 21-year-old Ukrainian activist and law student who we first spoke with a few weeks ago when she was on her way to a youth leadership conference out of the country. Unfortunately, while she was gone, her home in Kharkiv has been bombed and destroyed. So here's Alexandra talking about that. I don't really feel anything towards that. And I don't know if, whether it is a good thing or a bad thing, because like, for example, when the night we did this decision to go away from my hometown and the day we actually did it, I was like, okay, no hometown anymore. No thinking about it. Uh, nothing happened. Okay, I, I am moving forward. I like, keep moving. Nothing, nothing matters as far as me and my family is safe. So, yeah, really, I was like, not to say that I was expecting, like, because everyone who is leaving their home, they are like, please let my home survive. It, it will happen to every home, but not mine. But it, in reality, it doesn't work like this. So, yeah, but I don't know. I just don't, don't feel anything. And I, I don't know whether it is like a good thing that I just have this superpower of isolating my feelings and uh, being very rational, or is it a bad thing? Like I am just keeping it inside and I will have this moment of breakdown where this whole thing breaks out and um, yeah, I don't know, but we'll see. Pretty amazing composure there. Um, but also, you know, a reminder of the, the cost for individuals, even those who are out of the country and surviving. I mean, I saw the economics minister estimate, the Ukrainian economics minister estimate that this war has already cost them half a trillion dollars. Yeah, I, I think that like one of the things that the traps that we can fall into consuming this war is that you see these kind of defiant and sometimes even euphoric, you know, social media videos of Ukrainians, you know, standing up, fuck yeah, the Russians, tank, whatever, you know, yeah. we're going to rave on Putin's grave and, and all that stuff is very motivating. But that doesn't mean these people aren't experiencing profound loss and trauma. And and as you heard in her voice, like they might not experience that right away, right? Like, you know, you lose your home. Of, oh, okay. I, I can't quite process it yet. Six months from now, you know, the, the trauma that is being inflicted on these people, you know, the refugees are being greeted, you know, welcome. That's great. But like six months from now, they're going to be living in some apartment and some, you know, foreign land with their home destroyed. Uh, so the, the first point is we have to, to remember that underneath the kind of defiance um, that you see in these kind of videos and stuff, there's a lot of suffering that is probably going to take time to sink in but, with yeah. people like Alexandra. Um, and then the second thing is, that, you know, we are going to have to, you know, God willing, uh, when we get the chance, rebuild this country. Um, yeah, it's going to take and, a lot of money. And it's take a lot of money and, and it has to be spent. I mean, um, they are fighting on the front lines. I mean, there's something uncomfortable. I totally agree with our policy of not wanting to go to war, war with Russia, right? Um, but watching, you know, Biden in Poland talking about defending every inch and, you know, supporting the Ukrainians on the front lines of the fight, they, that the Ukrainians are on the front lines of this fight and they're the only ones fighting and dying, right? Um, together with some foreign volunteers. And and we do have an obligation to not, not pay that back, you know, um, in, in rebuilding this country. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about President Biden's speech, uh, his trip and some of the things that didn't go well. I think, you know, in general, the policy has gone yeah, yeah. quite well and has yeah. been handled, you know, really professionally and, and, and smartly and wisely, you know, the lack of escalation by President Biden. Um, and we should note that in that trip, uh, unbelievable staff work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything that the, just take the speech, everything from the venue to the speech writing yeah. as a speech writer, like it was a brilliant speech. Like it was done, the, the, there's some people working really hard. Here's the contrast I was trying to set up. President Trump <laughs> waited again. Oh, yeah. He's talking publicly about Russia and Ukraine. <laughs> Let's hear his priorities, what he's focused on at the moment. Why did the mayor of Moscow's wife give the Bidens, both of them, three and a half million dollars for them? That's a lot of money. She gave him three and a half million dollars. 
So now I would think Putin would know the answer to that. I think he should release it. I think we should know that answer. Trump is once again asking Putin for help finding dirt on the Biden family. That's his priority. No, yeah, right now yeah. in the middle of a war. In 2016, it was like Putin, can you hack Hillary's emails? And then it was <laughs> Zelensky, can you do me a favor? And then, I mean, the, the guy cannot look at any situation, including this horrific war, and think about anything but his own very narrow interests. And this man is the leader of the Republican Party. He's not just like some fucking blowhard. Like he's he. he yeah. It's just so funny. We're sitting here like yeah. nitpicking Joe Biden's performance and the uh, hardest yes, challenge you yeah, could ever yeah. take. Yeah, the yeah, contrast yeah. is this No, I, yeah, that's the thing. Is just a million times better than uh, Joe Biden. We are so lucky that he is in this job and not Donald Trump. Okay, so we obviously spent what, the last two months talking mostly about Ukraine. So we are going to talk about some topics now that we haven't been able to cover during the last month that are in other parts of the world because we've been so focused on Ukraine. We'll go a little faster yeah. uh, because we got a bunch of them. So starting in China, Ben, uh, on Monday, China announced a citywide coronavirus lockdown in Shanghai, which is the financial capital and largest city with 26 million people in it. All non-essential businesses are closed while authorities conduct mass testing. Uh, the lockdown has already impacted a bunch of companies, Shanghai, Disneyland, Tesla, many others. It's the latest in a series of city or province-wide lockdowns in China that have impacted tens of millions of people. I guess, I mean, I qu the question I have is like, just when you thought COVID-related supply chain disruptions were getting sorted out, stories like this make me think this, this can go on for, more, for years. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem with like a kind of total lockdown strategy, right? Is it that, you know... Yeah, the Chinese COVID zero. Yeah, it, once you get these more contagious variants in there, like it's going to spread. They have to figure out it some way, you know, the, I, this is... Are they going to be locked down for three more years? I mean, the, clearly we're living with like mutating COVID variants here. And, and, and if they are continue to kind of have this lockdown strategy... Anytime there's a new variant and there's a new outbreak and you have these massive lockdowns, you are going to have these disruptions. And by the way, you're also having a, a China that is like more and more cut off from the world just in terms of like, you know, intermingling of peoples. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, it does speak to a like a, a kink in the lo total lockdown strategy. To, you know, it's not sustainable. Yeah. And like, you know, even if the, the central government kind of lessens up on the rules, you know, you still have these provincial leaders who are worried about getting blamed if things spiral out of yeah. control. So there's always incentives to be kind of over the top. So uh, it seems not good. Um, a couple reports out of Israel, Ben. So first, at least 11 people have been killed in terrorist attacks in the past week, including reports of four or five people killed in a shooting near Tel Aviv a couple hours before we started recording. So this is obviously just horrific. Um, this comes as Israel is hosting a summit this week with the foreign ministers of the US, Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Egypt. Those meetings kicked off on Sunday. They're expected to cover things like Ukraine, the uh, talks of the Palestinians, Iran, especially efforts to revive the Iran nuclear deal. Ben, you know, the, the images out of this summit were clearly trying to project unity. They did one of those goofy, like, arms crossed yeah. holding hands. I never things. understand why that's like a thing. Not a fan. Yeah. Not a fan. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, look, this is, this is clearly like, okay, this is the new post-Abraham Accords political dynamic that they're showing the world. But, you know, some of the coverage I noticed framed it as an effort by Israel and these Gulf neighbors to coordinate on issues and sort of increase their leverage against the U.S. I wonder how Tony Blinken, who was over there for these meetings, felt about that framing in the coverage. It, it jumped out at me in some of it. Well, I mean, first of all, the, you know, the, the terrorist attacks are, are, are horrific and um, the loss of life, you know, it's really scary. And what's scary is like what is behind it, and yeah. when you start to see multiple attacks like this, you know, it makes you really concerned about a trend. So, you know, that that is obviously something that that nobody wants to see. Um, on the, you know, I'm sure that part of the impetus for what Tony Blinken is doing is. You know, there are constantly reports of us being at the doorstep of a return to the JCPOA. So close. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I imagine part of this is, you know, you get all the big countries because uh, the Saudis are basically represented through their their, their consigliere, the, the Emiratis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get them uh, to try to kind of, you know, reassure them, you know, brief them, uh, right. prepare them for for this. If the, It was funny, like when... Um, when people used to say, well, are you worried that the, um, these countries are going to start to, you know, make decisions without you or something? No. I mean, that like they, 
fine. Like I, the U.S. shouldn't. I don't want the U.S. to have to like make all the decisions in the Middle East. You know, yeah, it like, hasn't gone so well. Uh, it hasn't gone so well. And by the way, it's not like these countries like listen to us anyway. Nope. I mean, like every single one of the countries you named has done very profound things that are like against what U.S. interests are, what the U.S. would advise them to do. Um, I think that the harder challenge, right, is. Um, and the, and the, I don't put this on on Tony. It's it just the it, you you know you give a big speech about um, we're in a global generation defining struggle between democracies and autocracies, and then the next day you're in a photo op with Egypt and the Emirates. By the way, the Emirates just a few days after MBZ welcomed Bashar al Assad. Yeah. To the UE. We had Very to talk publicly. about this, right? Very yeah. publicly. Like it was, you know, photo ops, like cameras in there, um, smiles, you know. And and by the way, not only is Assad like a butcher, but he's also a Putin ally, yeah. right? Like yep. one of the few Putin allies out there. And so, you know what? Fine. Go off. Make your own decisions. Have fun. <laughs> Grow up. Like I'd rather be on the democracy camp. I believe that we're in a battle between democracies and autocracies. I also believe that you're not going to win the battle of autocracies if you're buddies with Mohammed bin Salman, you know? And, and so, you know, like I, yeah, is there some realism where we have to kind of work with these countries on something? Sure. But the things that we have to work with them on, you know, like terrorism, like th that's in their interest anyway. Um, we'd like to work with them on things like the Palestinian uh, issue, but it's not like, they were working with us on that as no, it was, you know, long like track record. Uh, of that yeah. Being yeah. It's tough. not like a track record of them. Uh, you know, so I, I do think at a certain point here, there, the, the, the discomfort and awkwardness of framing American foreign policy around a struggle between democracy and autocracies, and then, you know, clasping hands with like, uh, Egypt and, and the Emirates, you know, it, it, it's a problem that is going to have to untangle itself over time. Yep. That's a complicated one. Uh, you mentioned this, you know, the, the Iran nuclear deal, there's constantly reports that it's on the brink of being sort of unfrozen. The latest reports I saw is that it's stuck over whether the U.S. will reverse Trump's decision to designate the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, as a foreign terrorist organization. It's sort of like a standoff of who will blink first on that one. I don't know. I'll take this head on because <laughs> like, people are going to at me anyway. I mean, that designation doesn't really achieve anything uh, beyond the symbol, you know, like the, these are people who evade sanctions. Like the, these are not people that are like the, you know, Tehran business community trying to do stuff with Europe. These are right. people who live in black market economics, um, who've lived under different forms of sanctions and kind of overlapping designations and all the rest of it for a very long time. Um, if this is the impediment to getting a nuclear deal done and rolling back that nuclear program, like by all means, let's get the nuclear deal done. And by the way, even with the nuclear deal in place, you can impose designations. Uh, you can sanction uh, all manner of Iranian entities for things. Um, the, the idea is that we're going back to the status quo ante, where it was when the U.S. pulled out of the deal. Um, and, and I'd rather have that than the symbolism of a designation that doesn't accomplish all that much in the real world. Yeah. Sanctions are a means, not an end. Yeah. We kind of, we always that's forget the, that here. And that's not, the IRGC is completely deplorable and, yep. and they, they're, they're, they've, they've sponsored like all manner of bad shit. Um, and, and we should continue to try to deal with them in any, any number of ways. But you, you use sanctions not as an end, as you said, but to, to get something done. Uh, and in this case, if we can get done rolling back the Iranian nuclear program, um, I'd rather get that done. Yeah. And here's an example why. Uh, North Korea decided to let everyone know that they're still a pain in the ass. Uh, last week, they launched their first intercontinental ballistic missile, the uh, first time since 2017. Since that happened, Ben, I've seen some debate in the uh, non-proliferation nerd community that I do watch closely. Yeah, it's a great uh, community. It's a great community over whether this was a new and improved ICBM or whether there was maybe a failed launch and they faked some of the footage and that they really just launched an older missile. Either way. Bad news. We don't want this. Uh, the North Korean propagandist released this weird slow motion hype video about the missile test that makes um, Kim Jong-un look like <laughs> a guy who's about to wash out a Top Gun. <laughs> yeah. uh, good reminder, this problem was never solved. The net effect of the Kim-Trump relationship was basically North Korea getting a bunch of years of running room to improve their yeah. nuclear arsenal and missiles. So that's another fun one for President Biden. I mean, it, look, if, first of all, if you haven't watched the video, go watch the video. It's a great Because yeah. uh, Kim Jong-un, like, checking his watch and taking the sunglasses off and giving the nod, you know. Um, just so people know, I mean, 
if they have accomplished uh, this breakthrough with their ICBM capability, um, you know, this is their capacity to hit the continental United States with a nuclear weapon. So obviously, like, not a great outcome. Um, but, you know, to me, it just speaks that this problem isn't going away. And, um, you know, and, and by the way, it's going to get like, you know, the, the U.S. talked about seeking new sanctions to the U.N. Security Council. The Russians are not. Good luck with that. The Russians are not getting on board with that, given that the Russians are turning into the new North Korea, um, albeit with like 10,000 nuclear weapons or more than that. But, um, yeah, I mean, the ICBM thing is a concerning element. Sure is. Uh, a bunch of updates out of Afghanistan. Um so the most concerning is the UN says that more than half the country is on the brink of starvation. Uh, that's just sort of a, the, the human, humanitarian situation there has gone from very bad to worse uh, in part because of US sanctions. Uh, the Taliban has proven to be just as bad as we expected. Yeah. Last week, they had promised to allow girls to attend secondary school. They bizarrely reneged on that promise as girls were about to walk in. So that means young girls can't get more than a sixth grade education, which is horrific. The Taliban has also banned the BBC uh, and other international broadcasters from airing in the country. Uh, and back in the US, President Biden extended uh, temporary protected status, which will allow tens of thousands of Afghans who are living in the US as of March 15th to remain here for, I believe, 18 months, something like that. So lots of worrisome updates here, Ben, and all of them are made more difficult to address by the amount of time, money, and just mind share that is being spent on Ukraine. Not not that it shouldn't be spent on Ukraine, but it's just sort of, you know, you, it feels like Afghan, Afghanistan is getting forgotten. But, and it comes back to this question of what is the purpose of sanctions? Yeah. Um, and sanctions are not in any way affecting positively the Taliban's behavior, right? No. Um, and- We just read like three it, updates how it's getting yeah. worse. So it's not like they're, because we're sanctioning them, they're letting the girls go to school. Um, and so to my mind, I would rather lift those sanctions and try to save hundreds of thousands of lives potentially um, than keep those sanctions on and, and, and contribute to the starvation of Afghans because we don't like the Taliban. Uh, you know, it's as simple as that. Like they, the U.S. policy right now should be doing whatever we can possibly do to save the lives of as many Afghans as possible, whether that's helping them get fed or whether that's opening the door to more refugees, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and there's not a sense that, that, that there's urgency around that like there should be. Yeah, it's really- The, really the girls' stuff is, is horrifying and watching some of the videos of these girls realize that they can't go to school I know. was- <laughs> about as heartbreaking as, as anything you can watch. Now, again, I don't believe anything the Taliban says, no. but there were some spokespeople in the Taliban who were trying to claim like, look, you know, we're not ready on the decision. This is actually about trying to figure out what uniform uh, that schoolgirls will have to wear. It, the whole thing was just so confused and nonsensical and I don't know. Even there, I think that part of the issue is, are there other countries that have more influence with the Taliban than us that can lean on them? Yeah. Like the OIC, the Organi Organization of the Islamic Conference, like that's kind of the umbrella organization for um, for Islamic majority countries. Like, because, uh, you know, th th they're not going to listen to us. Um, but if, if your goal is to, to, to do whatever you can to get those girls in school, you know, part of what you'd be doing is quietly trying to talk to anybody who has any line into the Taliban to get them to stop being such fucking assholes. Yes. I feel yes. like I've used a lot of profanity. I'm sorry. Look. So the world is kind of rough. Right sometimes now. you got to do it. Uh, last story I have, and you know, maybe you won't want to use profanity now because I'm asking you to put on your royal hat. Mm. So this is more prim and proper. So a visit by Prince William and his wife Kate to Jamaica didn't go as well, I'd say, for the royal family uh, as they'd hoped because Jamaica's prime minister told Will that the country wants to be independent and remove the queen as the head of state. And they also had protesters calling on the UK to pay reparations for slavery. Uh, Prince William, you know, he sort of denounced slavery, but it, he pointedly didn't apologize, I don't believe. Um, a few months back, Barbados removed Queen Elizabeth as its head of state. Ben, you got any odds on the royals getting the boot from Jamaica? Feels like uh, that's where this is headed. Some momentum. I mean, the the Jamaicans did it like on camera too. Like it, was it wasn't really like a subtle thing. It was like, hey guys, uh, welcome. We would like to become an independent country. And no yeah. longer have you as our titular head of state. You, you know, um, here, I'm going to put on the royal hat for a second, please. Um, I mean, I I do think like, look, 
Will and Kate, you know, have have some qualities. Um, uh, <laughs> and what are those? They seem like, you know, uh, personable people. Did, did, uh, you, did you see the tweet from the Royal Correspondent? There's a I picture of Will. Okay, yeah, yeah. please, go ahead. Well, I'm going to get to that. Uh, but first thing I was going to say is like, they do need to kind of evolve, you know, like if, if they're kind of the next generation, if kind of the thing is mm-hmm. Queen, pretty old. Um, yeah. Like you know, Chinese, <laughs> um, uh, Charles, eh, you know, there's a lot of meh around Charles. Right. So the kind of the future of the monarchy rests on on these two. Yeah, sure does. They, you got to apologize for this slavery. You know, yes. you, you got to move to a different place in your family's bin and just kind of doing the tour where you show up and you you greet some children and you know you pose in front of Bob Marley's house and stuff they did. That might have like been a home run trip like 20 years ago. Like you need to kind of, I don't want to say. You know, they, we need woke royalties here, but like you need to kind of meet the moment here. You're, Acknowledge reality. You're the younger people. Like yes. speak to the history in a different way than your grandparents did, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I will <laughs> say, like, I think you drew this to my attention, the royal correspondent who said that- uh, His name is Richard Palmer. Posted some pictures of Will and Kate, looking good, I have to say, and said like, what a couple of crackers here. A couple of crackers <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. And then he follows up. Someone just told me that crackers mean something else in parts of the U.S. To be clear, I meant that these are a couple of cracking, excellent pictures. Honestly, you can't say anything. It was really uh, it's one great. of the funniest a things plus, I've ever seen. A plus content. I mean, sometimes sometimes you get a gift like that on Twitter. Um, yeah. Yeah. Occasionally it's good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you, you can't – how do they not know that these – questions and conversations are going to come up They're when they come. go on their yeah. colonial road show. And you need better answers. And somewhere between like Meghan and Harry, like just kind of bailing out on the family and doing an Oprah special and Will and Kate just kind of doing what their grandparents did, you know, visiting the Commonwealth countries a few decades ago, there's a middle there that they have to find here where, it, again, it's it, you're it's a little bit more closer to reality, acknowledging history um, making amends for it, imagining a different kind of relationship with a country like Jamaica. Um, and, and, and yeah, like need a little work here. Yeah. You know, the last thing I should have brought up, um, was, uh, the very sad passing of Madeleine Albright, yeah. who was the first woman to serve as secretary of state. She died at 84. Uh, her family, a child of Czech refugees fled the Nazis, rose to just a person of enormous prominence. Uh, she was the country's permanent representative at the UN, in the early 90s before becoming Secretary of State. Uh, it's been on the show a couple times. Incredibly sharp, yeah, kind, yeah, yeah. thoughtful person. Uh, she will be missed. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd add to that is just like, I, she mentored like just about everybody. Everyone. Um, and, and I remember when I was, you know, pre-Obama days, like when I was like a 20-something in, in DC, like she had this kind of dinner group at her house in Georgetown where she's just constantly inviting dozens of people over for these kind of discussions about foreign policy and you know, treated like, you know, 29 year old nobodies like me, the same way she treated like, you know, visiting foreign ministers. Like she was just an incredibly generous person with her time and and experience and, and wisdom. And so when, if people were kind of watching the reaction to her death, I mean like, huh, this is like a lot for a former secretary of state. Yeah. I think that's why it's because like almost everybody I know um, in in this field had some kind of personal experience of Madeleine Albright being very kind to them. It, it's a good lesson, by the way, of like, um, you know, be nice to people. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it matters, you know. You just remember forever the person who was nice to you. Yeah. When you're that age or when they're some hotshot and you feel like you're nothing and you're, 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 you feel like an imposter at whatever location you happen to run into them. Yeah. I mean, we experienced this in the Obama years. I mean, you, you could, you know, you could tell the, the cabinet types and, and you know, who were, went out of the way to be nice and then the ones who are just kind of dicks and and you know you you remember that yeah. you know like yeah on next episode we'll name names yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay we're going to take a quick break and when we come back you will hear Ben's conversation about the very 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 so many very important Hungarian yes. elections that are coming up so do not miss that this is the most important thing we got going on uh, besides Ukraine in terms of this fight against authoritarians I am very pleased to be joined by Catalin Che, who is a member of the European Parliament from the Momentum Party um, and vice chair of Renew Europe, a liberal group uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, Thanks so much for joining us, Catalin. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me. So I I just want to start. uh, You're obviously in the final days of the election campaign. Um, How are things going? What, What is your day like? What's it like to be 
trying to campaign to unseat Viktor Orban? Well, uh, these are extremely tiring, but also super motivating. I honestly haven't seen this much energy on the streets of Hungary in the, what, like four years? Oh my God, it's four years now. So in the four years uh, since I've been in politics, uh, we are doing a lot of rallies, uh, a lot of door knocking, uh, going around uh, in circles uh, to visit even the smallest place uh, all across uh, Hungary. I, uh, I'm doing a lot of events together with politicians from other parties as we are running in a broad coalition. So that's also an exciting experience to get to know each other's voters better. And uh, yeah, I, I just can't wait uh, until Sunday, not only because I'm tired, but uh, because I'm so hopeful <laughs> that this, this can be a very big day for Hungary and democracy in general. Yeah, no, I, I and I want to get into the opposition. I, I want to start by just asking you, though, to explain what some of the the structural hurdles are that you're facing. Um, you know, I think people hear about Orban um, and the kind of uh, illiberal model he sought to build. Um, how, how much do you guys have to overcome in terms of, you know, the the, the amount of votes you'd have to win uh, to prevail, given how he's drawn parliamentary districts? And, and, and what challenges do you face in just getting your message out with, with his kind of dominance of Hungarian media? So imagine playing basketball with a field that is tilted, like extremely, <laughs> and and you are not on the on the good end of the on, 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 of the field. Uh, this is what Hungarian politics feels like uh, in the past years. Uh, just a very quick recap: Orbán took power in 2010 uh, in the middle of the financial crisis, and he got uh, the supermajority of the votes, which in Hungary basically allow him to do anything he wants. And uh, instead of uh, you know doing good things like fixing our healthcare system or uh, raising wages for teachers, or uh, I don't know, just think about like any good thing you would do if you would have unlimited power. So like instead of all of this, uh, he dismantled the fragile system of institutions in Hungary. He redrafted the constitution without any sort of public consultation. He uh, obliterated the free media that we had here and uh, redraw the electoral districts extremely. And all this results in a situation where basically right now you can get to a constitutional majority with less than half uh, of uh, old votes cost he didn't even get a simple majority when it comes to the total number of the votes last time. And yet he controls over two thirds of the seats in parliament. Um, in terms of the more practical uh, ways of how it manifests in our democratic system, Peter Markizai, who is the opposition leader, he got five minutes of live airtime in the public broadcaster in the course of four years, five minutes in four years. And in the same day, the very same television channel repeated Orban's big rally speech nine times. So this is a good comparison, I believe. Big speech nine times a day versus uh, five minutes in four years. So you guys have to get your message out the old fashioned way by knocking on doors and literally meeting people because you can't really reach them on on the big television stations and, and radio stations, right? Yes. Uh, a very, very big part of uh, the Hungarian media is uh, controlled by, uh, by, by by channels that are close to Orban or his oligarchs or our public channels, which are funded by Hungarian taxpayers' money, but are actually used for uh, permanent campaign purposes. Um, and as we have some areas uh, in Hungary where people do not really have access to other medias apart from the free channels, uh, they, they have an extreme monopoly. And, and it also manifests itself uh, in, in, in very disturbing uh, situations. For instance, if you are an opposition party or an opposition candidate, the post office uh, refuses to distribute your uh, flyers. So you have to do it yourselves. 
if you want to buy posters, even though you would have money, a lot of companies are not uh, selling you billboard spaces. Uh, you are just in an extreme example if you want to speak up against the system. And uh, here we haven't even addressed the fact that uh, a lot of people, particularly in the smaller uh, cities or, or villages or in the poor parts of the country, are literally afraid to take your flyers because they are afraid. Uh, they are afraid that uh, if they are seen as somebody in favor of the opposition, then they could lose their jobs or lose their uh, contracts uh, with the city hall or just challenge their basic existence. Basically, when we had local election campaigns uh, in 2019, a number of our candidates from the Momentum Party had to step back from running because they were actually threatened at their workplace. Uh, we had an activist who got taken away by the uh, police like a year ago because he was critical with the government uh, on social media. So this is an extremely oppressed environment. And of course, we have to do a lot of groundwork uh, to try to bring the truth out and try to counter the uh, centralized narrative that Orban is spreading on every single available channel paid by our taxpayers' money. I'm curious, you know, I, I'm going to get to the opposition in a second here, but you mentioned the, the enormous advantage of Orban-friendly media. Are the people in Hungary consuming the war in Ukraine in the same way that people in the rest of Europe are? Is the truth about the war um, on, on television or is, is Orban shading that truth because of his, his longstanding ties to Putin? It's an extremely disturbing uh, situation what we have here right now. There is literally a war waging in our very neighborhood. Uh, those Hungarians who live close to the Ukrainian border, they can hear the sirens. And yet we have our public media that is founded by us Hungarians, which uh, spews Russian propaganda basically nonstop. Uh, seriously, we in the EU made... Uh, I think a very good decision when we ban the Sputnik and Russia Today and all the other Russian propaganda channels. But uh, in this situation, basically the Hungarian public propaganda is the last standing leg of Vladimir Putin in the union. And, and you just wouldn't believe if you turn on uh, the public television or uh, those channels who, uh, which are uh, close to the government, you hear these so-called experts going on air and saying things like uh, President Zelensky is a Nazi on drugs or that Ukraine is not a real country and has no, no rights of existence. Absolutely mind-blowing propaganda. And uh, it's, it's, it's really coming at you in such a massive uh, quantity. It's very hard to challenge it. But yet I, uh, I, I feel that it hasn't really gotten hold of the Hungarian public because the solidarity I feel uh, that are demonstrated towards uh, the Ukrainian refugees is so enormous. So I, I really hope that uh, this uh, pile of hatred and lies do not find a fertile ground in Hungary. Because with our history, we I, I, I truly believe that we are so much better than uh, what Orban believes uh, for our people to be. I have to imagine, like you said, that the, the, the general public mood in Hungary would be one that is sympathetic to Ukrainians and uh, wary of Russia, especially given the history of, of Russia's efforts to dominate Hungary. Is this a political vulnerability for Orban that he has, you know, obviously been so close to Putin over the years, um, continues to be the an outlier within the European Union in terms of sanctions on, on Putin? Do you see this as, a, as an issue in the campaign that could hurt Orban? I think he has a real hard time. You know, he has been selling this lie for the past 12 years that Vladimir Putin is a great friend of Hungary. He came to visit Budapest, I think, more than most European capitals. We were uh, hosting him uh, after the Crimea situation. And he was always portrayed in contrast with the West, which is failing, with the EU and the NATO, who are uh, our enemies. So, so this was the narrative that uh, was, was sold uh, to the Hungarian public via the enormous media machine of Orban for, for so long. And right now, people are actually faced with the truth that this guy who was portrayed by uh, portrayed as a friend of the country is actually a war criminal, is actually massacring children in our uh, neighborhood.
foreign country. And, and in the same time, the opaque dealings of uh, Orban really put Hungary in an extremely vulnerable position. So there are two things. One is morality, which, which I really think uh, has uh, to be 100% on the side of, uh, of the victim and, of not, and not the oppressor. But also the very practical reality is that Orban really subordinated the country to Putin. He uh, made long-term energy deals uh, with him even after, uh, after Crimea happened. He contracted Russian companies uh, to, to build our nuclear power plant. Like, you know, we are, our nuclear power plant is built by the same guy is actually shooting at uh, nuclear power plants in our neighborhood. There is an extreme amount of uh, entanglement between the Russian elite and the uh, Hungarian government. And uh, this, this makes us very vulnerable and very isolated. Orban is losing even his last friends in the EU over his ties to, to Russia. You know, the Polish government openly criticized him. And just a few days ago, the meeting of the Visegrad for the regional Central European uh, bloc of cooperation that Orban was very fond of, uh, actually refused to meet the Hungarian side in Budapest over his uh, stance on Putin. So if Orban stays in power, we will become the pariah of, uh, of the EU for a very long time to come. And I sincerely do not wish uh, this to, to happen to our country because it weakens us so much in such a critical time. Yeah, no, and I think people, you know, people who don't follow this closely should know that for, for, for Poland to do that, Poland has embraced a kind of right-wing brand of nationalism and, uh, and, and some of the illiberal tendencies of Orban. So for them to break with, with Orban um, over this is a, is a big step. I wanted to ask you about the opposition. So you, you guys have pursued this um, strategy that, you know, you explained to me, um, I guess, back in 2019, feels like a long time ago, when I met you in, in Budapest. Uh, where the opposition is running as a united front across several different parties, all supporting the same candidate for prime minister. Um, how is that going? What has it been like to, to, to band together with different parties, the establishment socialist, uh, you, you know, uh, even some, some parties that used to be on the far right? It's a big tent over your opposition. H how is that working in practice? And, and, and where, where does the campaign stand in terms of um, your hopes for succeeding? I, I am very glad that we realized after so many years uh, in a hybrid autocracy that there are issues way more, more severe that threaten our country uh, that are just overarching the existing uh, differences we have with certain other parties in terms of certain policies. Right now, really, the basic foundations of the democratic principles of this country is threatened. The basic direction of the country is threatened. Uh, the direction of whether we are going towards the West or the uh, direction of the autocracies is under, under danger. And we have to fight for such fundamental principles like the rule of law or equality or the freedom of the media. Nobody could have imagined that, that we are in this situation in 2022. So uh, this united a lot of very different parties. I have to say, though, that uh, this has been a cooperation since uh, three years now. With the very same coalition, we scored a decisive victory at the 2019 local election. And ever since, we are governing a lot of uh, cities together, including Hungary's capital, Budapest. And, and what happened this autumn was, was truly a miracle for me. You know, the opposition managed to stage a very large-scale national primary election where every party uh, put forward their own candidate and the Hungarian voters uh, chose who will represent the united opposition. And for the American uh, listeners, this might not be a new thing because primaries are uh, a well-established uh, way of conducting democracy in, in your country. But for us, it is complete novelty. And, and we did it in a way... Where, uh, where crowdfunding was our biggest source. We introduced innovations like online voting, and we saw such a huge turnout. Hundreds of thousands of people went out to vote. We had lively public debates in television. And uh, I, I just really felt that the country is really yearning for democracy, uh, for, for, for these like basic principles of having a debate of the leaders on the television, which we don't have by the way. So last time Orban debated was in 2006. So really what happened is, is really 
an insight into what our country could be if uh, we could do it right. And ever since uh, the primary elections went down, ever since we elected Peter Markizai as the leader of the opposition, uh, we are campaigning together. We wrote a joint policy program together. We are preparing to govern the country because we know that it's going to be a big task. So, so we we don't uh, think, of course, that our uh, problems will be over when Orban is out of office. No, like the real challenge starts then. But I am 100% sure that we are prepared to take this responsibility and uh, restore Hungary in the, uh, in the place where it, it belongs to the heart of the Western alliance of uh, the transatlantic cooperation of EU, NATO, and, uh, and also to bring higher welfare for the Hungarian people who, who have been really suffering in the last years due to extreme inflation and rising food prices and governmental neglect during COVID. Well, and uh, yeah, when you're out campaigning, what, what is the message that resonates that you find with voters about what you would do if you replaced Orban? Like, what, what is the, the program that you think people uh, w- respond to uh, in, in terms of a, a post-Orban Hungary? There are a lot of problems that uh, people are worried about. Uh, and I, I think, first of all, what really resonates with them is, is good and open conversation. Because we are paying a lot of uh, attention on that, uh, having deep talks, explaining policy to people, listening to them. I think a lot of people really gave up on hoping that uh, politics could change or their voice uh, could be be heard by by those in power over the last 12 years. And and then first of all, I think the the really open sentiment that uh, we are putting forward in this campaign really changed this. Um, But in terms of the concrete ideas, uh, what I find very, very troubling that uh, is that so many people left the country over the past decade to work abroad, and not because they wanted to, which is, of course, completely fine, but because they needed to. There is an extreme amount of uh, migration westwards from Hungary, and, and uh, this really has an impact on our society. So many people are only seeing their kids or grandkids on, on, on Skype they don't meet them only like once or twice in in in, in a year and, and it is uh, really causing a lot of people to to really evaluate uh, their choice of government is that this country is, is it really a place where people are leaving from and of course they are leaving from because uh, the cost of living has never been higher in hungary than before than, than now uh, the wages of a, a nurse or a teacher of you know, people in such basic professions have uh, never uh, been worse compared uh, to to what is necessary, and uh, and really the, the mood in general is just so vile and so full of hatred and misogyny and 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 oppression that this is really felt even on the day to day basis. Families are falling apart uh, over politics. People are getting divorced. Those who do not share uh, the opinions of the government are called like traitors of the country and all that. And this really creates a very depressing uh, state of mind of so many Hungarians. And of course, uh, when they go to the gas station and uh, they they see that uh, uh, just even getting to work uh, is even more difficult as uh, we actually faced a gas shortage in the last past days. These are things that are really troubling. But I have to say that in the past days, ever since the war broke out, the war really put everything into a different perspective. And a lot of things that we talked about for for long before, about the necessity of rule of law, of uh, our international uh, partnerships, of the defense of democracy, I think it's really put uh, everything into a different perspective. So... So, so even those are our questioning, our basic uh, foundations uh, of, uh, of, of the country, our basic directions, who uh, are not necessarily political because they see where uh, autocratic uh, leanings can, can take us. And this is not a good place. Yeah, I was going to ask you to, to end by describing the stakes but uh, for the world as well as Hungary, but I think you, you, you kind of just did. I mean, I, I, I'll give you one more chance. To, I mean, I, I know you were in Ukraine after the war started. I know you guys have over 100,000 refugees there. 
I mean, how much has this war kind of elevated the stakes for what was already an important election? I mean, it was important enough that Donald Trump felt the need to endorse Viktor Orban. Um, you know, it's been important to the far right uh, that Orban succeed. Um, but, you know, given your experience in Brussels, in Budapest, and, um, and in Ukraine recently, um, how do you see the stakes for the world uh, for what happens in your election? First of all, I think we have a global responsibility here because Hungary was, I believe, the first country that started this recent wave of uh, democratic backsliding, which really spread to so many countries uh, all across the world. And I think we also should be the ones stopping it, trying to uh, show a recipe to the rest of the world of uh, how to combat populists and autocrats. Um, and but there are so much really the stakes are so high uh the, the question of a united western alliance or one where the trojan horse uh, of putin still sits at the table and vetoes really impedes our uh, capacity to act fast and uh, move forward with strong sanctions for instance but also to reform our communities in a way that uh, can be responsive for uh, such geopolitical challenges. I think also when it comes to the European perspective, the, the question is uh, further integration of the EU, of us gathering strength in the world, becoming a player or uh, fragmenting ourselves back to the 1980s where, where Orban would like to see us. Um, it's such a fundamental election. But for Hungarians who, who might not see these uh, very global perspectives, just care about their lives, it's also an election where, where they can choose you know, freedom over oppression, uh, comp competency and competition over uh, a corrupted nepotistic uh, oligarchy, West over East, and uh, peace and security over a war criminal. So uh, I'm very much hopeful that my predictions will be right. And uh, this energy that I'm seeing all across the country will bring us over the finishing line. And we can really, really show to the world that Hungary is so much more than Viktor Orban. That we are actually good hearted people. Uh, we are democratic minded people. We want to belong to the West as Hungarians. We are, we are not evil, uh, hateful, disruptive people. We are a beautiful country with a lovely cuisine, uh, a very welcoming hospitality sector. So I, I really hope that news of Hungary will cover these more exciting and more truthful aspects of my uh, country in the future. But uh, yeah, for this, you really have to wish us a good luck uh, for this Sunday's election. I wish you good luck for this Sunday's election. Uh, I uh, I found you to be one of the more exciting young European politicians, not just Hungarian politicians. Um, and, and we're all rooting for you. I mean, we all need Hungary to be a full and democratic member of uh, of the Western Alliance. So um, particularly now. So thanks so much for, for joining us and good luck in those final days campaigning. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks again to Kathleen Che for, for joining the show. Uh, thank you. Uh, who else are we thank in here? Thanks oh. to everybody who's doing a March Madness, midterm madness. Excuse All the bracket. Hungarians knocking on doors, you know, um, getting the vote out. Do you think, uh, what kind of intimidation is going on there if you're working for the opposition? So this was, you know, as you heard Catalan say, right? Like what's crazy is that like some people are afraid to take their flyers because they could get like fired from their job, you know, if they're seen as- uh, Oh, good. Like there's all, like it's a very- Early Putinism, not early, kind of mid Putinism intimidation of like essentially, you know, you could just, you don't want to end up being blacklisted uh, in terms of work or education by a ruling party that is vindictive, right? So, yeah. so the people knocking on doors are, you know, they're putting their necks out there. That's big. That's big. Well, we're thinking of them. Uh, okay. Well, that's it for us. Uh, we'll talk to you guys next week.